Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Uh, today is uh, Thursday, tenth, and we have uh, tonight with us Martin White, which is going to talk us about uh, workarounds. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and people online. I hope that you're seated comfortably and are having a nice supper as I as I talk to you. I'm very grateful to Antonio for inviting me to be here tonight because uh, he agreed to this when I still had the book as a distant, maybe I should have it done by April. So he was very kind and said, well, you know, come along anyhow, and we'll see how we go. A little bit about me. Um, you'll, you'll see that my email address on the front cover is Intranet Focus, which is what I was doing from 1999 up until a couple of years ago. I've now got a new business called Search Research Online, which is about research into search, would you believe I'm a visiting professor at the Information School at the University of Sheffield. We've been doing that since 2002. And I've built a little search network of consultants around the world. We all chat to each other once a month. I've written rather a lot of books. My wife is not keen on this fact, but nevertheless, she's very good to me. And uh, so far, I've got well, this will be my 10th. Much of my work, I'm an information scientist by profession, I'm a chemist by training, information scientist by profession. And as you can understand with a company called Intranet Focus, I used to focus on intranets. And the way that I typically started an intranet project was to try and find an interviewee at various levels up the management chain. Someone, a new joiner, someone who'd been at, um, there maybe for 15 years and then a divisional manager and so on. So I looked at a sort of vertical stack that I could then branch out if I found particular areas that I wanted a bit more detail. And that's when I discovered that what people did was not what they said they did. And what's more, what they said they did was not what they should have been doing. But believe it or not, the companies were very successful. So clearly, there's a, even though they were doing it theoretically incorrectly, the business was working very well. So no one really worried about how they were doing it until business process management came along. So that was really my beginning. I found numerous instances of where employees really were very loath to tell me exactly how they did their job. And that's when I discovered that if I passed my pen across them at the end and said, look, you take the pen, because when, when you've got the pen, I'm not taking notes. So when you've got the pen, you can tell me exactly how you do it. And that's when the gap between what they thought, what they were supposed to be doing and what they actually did started to emerge. But what I want to talk about tonight, really four, six broad headings. How many workarounds have you got in your organization? Do you know? Does anyone know? I want to talk a bit about how the, the, the research has developed. It goes back to 1986. The first research paper on workarounds 1986 and then where was the origins of workarounds why are people doing workarounds i want to differentiate between processes and procedures this is slightly artificial but naturally very important and then of course we've got chat gpt what difference is that going to make to workarounds and then some thoughts about what the implications are for the consulting profession now the book will be a two or three weeks time. The good news is it's free. It's an open source book. But workarounds are absolutely everywhere. These are just some examples. 70% um, of workers are using chat GPT at work but not telling their boss. Okay. Rise of shadow IT with, with remote working. People just get on and do whatever they want, want to do. And the most prevalent shadow IT your smartphone, because no one knows what you're doing with your smartphone talking to someone else on their smartphone, totally outside the control of IT. And have you ever thought about the fact that when you do a cut and paste, you're doing a workaround? Because you could type it out in full, but you find another document, maybe one you've written, maybe one that someone else has written, and you take a paragraph out and put it into yours. And how often do you actually put, I pinched this from Fred? Yeah. We all do workarounds. So a little bit about the background of the book. As I said, I'm a visiting professor at Sheffield. 
And they have started a, pla a plan to produce open access textbooks for students written by the, le the academic staff. Because textbooks are now so expensive, whether it's paperback or whether it's electronic. Um, and also they are usually out of date by the time they arrive on the student's desk. So what Sheffield are doing is getting the lecturers to start writing some books that are then available to, primarily to the students. Um, and so far, Sheffield have got three books on the way, and they're all written by me. Something wrong there. Um, I start off writing a book on the history of enterprise search that was published last year. And then I spent two years with a colleague writing a history of the Institute of Information Scientists, which disappeared in 2002, but is, it was crucial to my development as an information scientist. And this is the front cover. Do you, anyone recognize the photograph? It's a lunar module or lunar excursion module. That's a picture from the National Air and Space Museum in, in Washington. The reason that's there is because that's probably the definitive example of a workaround. It's also the definitive example of a workaround that didn't work. If you watched Apollo 13, or you can remember back to 1986, you remember the problem was that the service module blew up and basically they had to rethink the entire mission to get them around the moon and back down to earth safely. Um, and it was an enormous task. Uh, and huge teams were working on all sorts of workarounds to get them home. But why did the service module explode? Well, that's interesting because a few months previously, they had one of the oxygen tanks on test and they realized that not all the oxygen had been taken out. There was liquid oxygen in it and they wanted to take it out to refill it correctly. So they thought, ah, I know, oxygen evaporates at a temperature. So what we'll do is we'll put the heaters on inside the oxygen tank and the gas will just come out the oxygen tank. And indeed it did. The only problem was that the voltage inside the tank was 28 volts and the voltage they applied was 68 volts. So it burnt the switches out. But no one knew that until they used those switches about 150,000 miles from Earth. So the fact that they had to do the workaround was due to a workaround. And that's one of the big issues because often the implications of a workaround are not visible at the time. They only become visible way down the line. This is roughly what's in the book and it's quite small text, but I'll give you a sense. I, I started by talking about Apollo 13 and then actually, although we think of workarounds as an IT issue, they're all over the place. Do you know where the concept of due process came from? The idea of a process. 1386, an act of parliament from Edward III. And that was the first institution of the due process of law. Because up until then, people made the law up as they went along. This act of parliament said, no, it's a process. And you have to go through all the processes step by step. And ever since then, lawyers have spent their lives trying to find out how to get around that process without actually breaking it. Is there another way we can do this? But we still have to go through that particular court. So I, I talk about that. I talk about how the measurements, the whole shooting match. You can, you'll find out that out a little bit through this talk, and I'm not going to go through every one. But it's been fascinating to write. Because actually, there's a huge amount of academic research on workarounds. There are probably over 2,000 research papers, but most IT managers will never have seen them, will never have understood what they're talking about. But there's a group of IT managers who do, and they're in the healthcare industry. In hospitals, workarounds are seen as a source of innovation. In the enterprise, they're seen as bad boys, don't do it like that. And there's a huge amount of interest in, in the clinical side in having nurses involved directly in the development of systems. Because the nurses are alongside the patient every day. And the thing about a hospital system is, if it doesn't work, the patient dies. And that's a very strong initiative to say, let's see if we can do anything 
with making our systems work better. So, 1380, 1368, I think I got the year wrong, the observance of the due process of law, and interestingly, appears in the Constitution of the United States as the Fifth Amendment. So this concept of process is very old. And it's rather interesting that we often don't think what a process is, and I want to come on in a minute to the difference between a process and a procedure. And I think they're quite different. The term workaround was first used in the aerospace industry in about the early 1960s. Uh, and quite commonly in the press about the Mercury missions and the Gemini missions and whatever, and the workarounds that were there in aircraft design. And it's very interesting. There are some papers back in the early 1980s, which already start to say, we have a problem because the way that people work in an office is not the way we think they work. And this is in the early 1980s. And, and in 1986, a, um, uh, a guy called Les Gaspin wrote a PhD thesis on this in which for the first time, he said that workarounds are something real. This is a concept you have to pay attention to. Um, very highly cited paper. But it really wasn't until the mid, mm, mid 20, 2010, 2012, that all of a sudden workarounds became sort of important. And that's because they'd invested in business process management. Gartner discovered business process management in about 2010. And when Gartner discovers business process management, every IT manager has to go and buy a business process oh. management application. They don't know what to do with it, but they buy one. And you can see the, P, you know, the rate of growth of business process management software started about 2010. Um, and as a result of that, it also gave researchers the ability, they thought, to track workarounds, because now you can take the data logs and you can spot where the workarounds are. Uh, no, we'll come on to why that is shortly. So this is a very interesting paper. Lucy Suchman, and she wrote, she first presented this Office Procedure as Practical Action, Models of Work and System Design in 1980. She worked at Xerox and Xerox Park were very early on in the use of a technique called ethnographic research, which is basically interviews, surveys, very carefully handled to find out how people work. And much of what's in that paper, you can look at in 2023 and say, why didn't we bother to listen to her? in 1980 because the working practices we have within an organization are very poorly defined and yet we just get more and more functionality look at teams Can compare teams of what it was three years ago it's full of additional functionality but how much of it is actually used on a day-to-day -day basis not much because most people go and use zoom and google because it satisfies 90 percent of their needs so this has been a long time in the process. Let's, let's, let's have some definitions. I'm not going to ask you to read it, but I ask you to note Stephen Altair. Stephen Altair is a very distinguished professor specializing in IT systems. And in 2014, he wrote a book, uh, wrote a paper called The Theory of Workarounds. It has been cited something like 750 times since. It is the definitive paper. And ever since then, people have expanded a bit there, changed a bit there, taken this terminology and changed it. Fundamentally, this is the start and almost the finish of workarounds. It's such a comprehensive paper. And of course, the Australians do things differently. The Australians have a concept called feral practices. Yeah, and it's only the Australians who use this term, and I don't know why, because feral is related to animals, you know, wolves and you know kangaroos or whatever. I don't know half of their Australian animals. And then you come with shadow IT, and shadow IT with a capital S, sort of emerged in around about 2011, 2012. 
It was sort of around there. And what's the difference between these? Let's take feral away. Frankly, it's an Australian disaster area. Um, but a workaround uses the systems that are in place. They're already compliant. IT managed them. But a workaround is using a system that has basically already been signed off by IT. Shadow IT is when someone is using an application which hasn't been signed off by IT. They've just decided, hey, this is good. And of course, with cloud systems, anyone can basically, hey, we'll just, we'll just have another system. You know, and typically, a company may have half a dozen different project management solutions. Every department has a different one that's up in the cloud because it, they can get it under the procurement window. And this is a, this is a really big problem um, with, shadow, with shadow IT. And one of the issues is, is shadow IT a workaround? Now, I think it is, but there are people who say, no, shadow IT is something totally different. So feral practices you can ignore, but the, the research and the experience and the surveys very much focus around workarounds and shadow IT. Incidentally, these slides will be available if you want to save the battery in, your, uh, in anyone's mobile phone. Now, you know all about this because everyone knows how simple it is to do enterprise system integration. You know, you've all read the how, you've all read the promotions from SAP and IBM and etc. You just get the stuff and it goes in. Well, that's what Waitrose thought, and it's cost them an arm and a leg because they transferred from one ERP system to another. And of course, you've got you know British Telecom and the uh, sorry British Post Office and the Horizon scan scandal. One of the things that I've done, which has not been done before is I compared what goes on in enterprise information system, which what goes on in clinical information systems, because there are, these two never talk to each other. And the systems are usually developed by people totally different. Um, the biggest selling um, electronic health record system is by a company called Epic. Um, and Epic don't do anything in the enterprise, in the enterprise IT side. Now, we all know that enterprise information systems They've been around for what, 19, mid 1980s, something like that. Lots of experience. Um, they're basically on data focused processes, numbers and alphanumeric strings and things like this. Um, and if you get something wrong, it's very unlikely that the its implications for, implicate, implications for a customer. You know, they may get twice what they thought they ordered, but it's not life or death. When you go to electronic health record systems, which started in 2010, 2011, mainly in America, it's very interesting because there was no prior experience of using digital systems. All their systems were paper-based, largely paper-based. So they had an enormous problem of converting paper into digital at the speed of which Epic, in particular, was installing it in their hospital. And I was in a major UK hospital when this was happening. And you could see the stressed out look, not of the implementers, but the doctors. Now, what's interesting about electronic health records is they contain text, they contain patient records, they contain notes of treatment. Some of it may be in fielded boxes, a lot of it is just grabbed as people go along. Oh, we gave them so and so, and they had this reaction. And the potential for, the, for EHR to have an impact on patient health is colossal. And no one until I came along, sorry to be um, biased, had ever looked at what the differences and similarities were between the two, because there are some similarities and there are some differences. One of the big differences is that in the hospitals, they read the research literature. Because they are clinicians, they're often university trusts in the UK, they have access to digital libraries. One of the problems with the enterprise IT is they have no access to that type of research. It just doesn't exist as far as they're concerned. And that, you know, this is typical, isn't it? You know, this is, oh, isn't this lovely? Now, nice separate boxes, and you know, oh, this, this is the way it's going to go. But I love this warning from a man called Alan Pelt Sharp. For many automation projects, headcount reduction is the critical metric. 
Although headcount is often reduced, the expected savings are usually short-lived if they appear at all. People who are remote and dissociated with day-to-day -day work activities underestimate by large margins the complexity of regular work activities and the value of human intelligence in the organization. A few years ago, I was doing an uh, internet search project for a very large engineering products company. Let's disguise their names. And we looked at the, as we walked in and started going around, we realized that the enterprise search, the internal search, was absolutely terrible. But the people working on it said, oh, we keep on trying to make it better. And look, hardly anyone uses it. But, but when we talked to all the, you know, the product managers and the other employees, they said, no, search, it's superb. We always find what we're looking for. Something wrong here somewhere. So we did some user testing. We sat them in front of a screen and said, find this information. And that's when we discovered that everyone was using the web search, not the internal search. For them, search worked. But the search on the website was beautifully curated. It was owned by people. It was every time anyone so had a problem, they, meant, they sorted it out. Internally, it was run by IT who had no idea about search. And that's a very interesting way that no one in IT actually knew how employees were searching for product information. And this was a company with over 4,000 product lines. We were having a discussion earlier on about functional and non-functional specs. <laughs> um, and, you know, functional specifications, I'm glad I'm not a business analyst. It's a tough job. But it's a process, it's a well-developed process. There are all sorts of models you can use. And, but no one pays attention to the non-functional requirements. Ease of use. And they're very dependent on the skills of an individual employee. Not many people look at it this way. First of all, how long have people been using the application? Secondly, how frequently do they use it? Is this something they use every hour, every day, or every week, or maybe once a year? Because they will have different ways of coping with it, depending on their whether they use it on a frequent basis or not. And, how, and the depth, how many of the features of that application do they use? This is usually totally unaware in the design of the system. And yet it makes a big difference on how people will use it. A good example is if you look at the enterprise search logs of most companies in Europe, not the UK, because we're not in Europe anymore, you will find a lot of people search for the word concor, C-O-N-C-U-R. This is a search term that they will use on average once a month. That's because concor is the SAP enterprise uh, expense record machine that you had to put your expenses in before you get paid. And of course, it has to be found and the data has to be entered. And you can never remember where it was because it's a month since you last filled it in, maybe earlier. And so everyone goes into the search application to find where Concor is. Because most organizations probably have, I don't know about your experience, four or 500 different applications they've got floating around. So how on earth do people let alone get used to them? And this question of how often you use it is often overlooked. The assumption is everyone who's a marketing manager uses the marketing product database the same way. Um, no, you haven't talked to them recently. One well, of the problems, and I'd be interested in your, your comments, is that you can't find out whether the non-functional work until the thing's been implemented. That's, that's essentially, in my experience, most companies don't know what the difference between efficiency and effectiveness is. Yeah. They actually don't know that there is a difference, um, and they they all worship the false god of efficiency. So I f they, they can't be assessed until you've done the implementation, and by that stage, it's too late to say, sorry, we got it wrong. Oh, you're sorted out. Just go ahead and sort it. And that's where a lot of the workarounds come from, because people are expected to use the new system and deliver even more productivity but actually they're finding it even more difficult to use. Um, 
And this is where so many workarounds and shadow IT come from, because the system doesn't meet their requirements. And often the best people you have are the most adept at creating workarounds, because they know the system. They've got networks. They understand how you can push the system. And one of the biggest problems that we, actually I was listening to last night, I was at a BCS Sussex branch meeting on neurodiversity. Very few IT implementations take account of the problems with people who are on, have some neurodiverse um, uh, condition. Dyslexia, probably one in eight people has dyslexia. Um, they require, they, they can work very effectively when they change things like screen um, font type, background color, all those help people with dyslexia to read a screen. Have you ever tried doing it on an IT system? You can't do it. Because yes, black or white, what more do you want? So what's driving work, uh, work around adoption? Here are just some of them. Inadequate functionality. They don't actually do what I want them to do. A, a classic example you find is the use of Excel spreadsheets to add together individual items on an order, and then the sum is placed in the enterprise system because the enterprise system doesn't give you a branch to say, put all the products in here and add them up. There isn't a mathematical function in the software. It's assuming you actually do it somewhere else because, oh, that, that would be difficult. You bypass, you bypass obstacles. Um, a lot of them are where I don't know what the system's doing. Hmm. Um, there's a what I'm showing you there is that what 15 or so different ways that workarounds start to arise. And the thing is, they're all invisible to the organization. No one has a clue. Because in the enterprise environment, you don't want to be hauled up in front of your boss to say, why are you using this application in this way? You're supposed to be able to do this process in three minutes. And you took six minutes. I've got the log to show me. You're always taking six minutes. Could be that they have problems reading the screen. And six minutes actually for them seems like a lifetime. A lot of this is based on this man out here. Now, his paper is open source. And if you go into Google and just go Altair, Theory of Workarounds, it's a 30 page document that will tell you just about all you ever need to know about workarounds, other than what's in my book, of course. Yes. But, he, but he comes at it from an IT systems perspective. Um, by the way, I'm in, in, when I'm talking about workarounds, I'm not talking about people who are deliberately trying to wreck the system. That's a whole different area. Mary A has entered the waiting room. Shall I admit that? I can do that. You've done that. Right. Um, have you come across the concept of psychological stress? It's, it's been around since 2003 by two people called Bauer and Fries. Innovation is not enough. Climates for initiative and psychological safety. Psychological safety is seen to be now very important because when we're using a system, we are stressed if the system is putting us in a difficult position. And this is not a, a, a physical stress, if you like, but it, it all builds up inside our head. And we're beginning to see that psychological safety, psychological stress are enormous drivers of workarounds because people want to try to regain control of their lives. They want to feel they're in control of the system, not the system being in control of them. And it's a big issue about burnout. Um, and if you talk to HR managers, often people won't say when they leave, well, oh, well, I didn't quite fit. And surveys are showing that it's actually down to a psychological stress that they just can't explain. They just feel it's almost pounding in their chest. They can't make the system work. And yet they can't change the system. What options do they have? They have to leave. And remember, these may be your best employees. And this goes back, the, the concept goes back to 2003. And as so often happens, it's only now in 2023, we're starting to understand what psychological stress is all about. This is an example of where the research 
is very visible, but it doesn't appear in Gartner Group reports, therefore it doesn't exist. And when you do psychological stress in the workplace on Amazon, you come up with 226 results. So there are a lot of books out there on the subject. <laughs> oh, how are you going to find out if you've got workarounds or shadow IT? Now, this is interesting because you've got two fundamental processes. One of them is quantitative. It's measuring numbers of transactions, how long you do, do a transaction. Um, how long the overall process takes. And this comes from business process management tools, particularly um, process mining applications. And they can show you dashboards that you wouldn't believe would ever exist because they've tracked every single one down. But they're based primarily on the number of keystrokes and on a time basis because they've worked out how long a particular process should take. There's a bit of an issue here about does, does the employee know that you are they are being watched? This has implications in terms of employee relationships and um, GDPR, particularly if that employee has got some form of neurodiverse condition. You know, big brother is watching you. Um, and they may not even be aware that they're using a workaround because someone else had said, hey, John, do it this way. They don't know that it's a workaround. They're just taking it from someone they trust. Yeah, well, yeah, it works. Or do you go down the qualitative route using ethnographic methodologies, surveys, talking to people? But it's very difficult to work out who to talk to. Because if you don't know who's doing a workaround, how can you go and talk to them? Because no one wants to sort of put it up on the notice board, hey boss. I've just found this great way of fixing the, the, the finance system. You do it this way. It's very difficult to scale from a small sample. But what frightens me is that when you look at the research, typically the academic researchers are given a, a, a cohort of perhaps 10, 15 employees that the, the firm has said, look, go and talk. Here's 15, 10 to 15 employees. Those 10 to 15 employees may give rise to 30 or 40 workarounds. Now, this is a random sample. So if there's just 10 to 15 which were chosen just because they were known to the person in the company leading the research, it's a pretty good idea that there are a lot more workarounds than that company thought there might be. And then you have a problem is when you're doing these interviews, do you use in-house staff or do you contract people in from the outside? Because if you use in-house staff, there's always the worry about, hmm, I can't tell them exactly what I did. There may be a big bias, and yet we can't, we, we can't afford to have consultants in and tell them this. Let's just do a survey. And the challenge for a company looking at workarounds is what's the balance between business process management, process mining, and qualitative? Because they actually need to be brought together to see if you can get a sense of where the problems arise. So I, let's do some BPM, uh, process mining, and then that, um, that's an interesting process there that's clearly not going well. OK, let's now go and do some interviews and get Martin White in because he's good at this and do, uh, and do some interviews. It's, it's really quite a difficult task. And when it comes to shadow IT, I sort of did this at the end. If you go into Google and do shadow IT, you'll find so many surveys. Um, where is this one? Uh, 58% of employees aren't completely satisfied with their company's technology. Oh, gee, that's good news for the CIO. Shadow IT makes up the majority of the app portfolio um, because you just get it and use it. Um, and 80% of workers admit to using SaaS applications at work without getting approval from IT. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's these surveys are quite thorough. Because people don't mind revealing that they're using shadow IT because it doesn't give much away. But if you ask them about workarounds, they don't want to be interviewed. But if you just look at shadow IT and say this probably only represents, let's say, half of all the workarounds that is happening inside a company, there's an awful lot of broken systems in the organization. 
So the answer to the question about how prevalent are workarounds is no one knows. We have absolutely no idea, either at a grossed up level or within an organization. As I've already commented here, it may be, they may, people may be willing to tell an external survey company what systems they use, but you can almost guarantee that everyone's using Excel, because Excel is both a database and it's a spreadsheet, and you can do almost everything with Excel, and then plop it into the enterprise application later on. But that came up yesterday in this discussion on neurodiversity, because what people were, the, the panelists were saying, is that in enterprise IT systems, there's no back button. If you think you might have made a mistake, you can't go back and say, ah, it should have been euros and I've used the pound value for that product. It's gone, it's gone down the line. And that means that they take much more care trying to get it right, which means that they look as though they're using the process in a very strange way. And a little right goes off in, this, in the CIO's office and says, mm, better go and have a look at that. It's usually because the, it's not fit for purpose. Um, and of course, there's actually no incentive to disclose a workaround. Because basically, you're saying IT have not done a good job. Yeah. The business analyst got it wrong. The business analyst didn't get it wrong. The process is correct, but they didn't identify how the user was going to use the application to complete the process. Um, I think I'd, I want to talk about this a little bit because there's a similar rule of thumb that says in most organizations, Martin, yeah. we have a question from the public. Yeah. It's asking if you could quote the sources of the statistics. Uh, I think the previous slide. Yeah, that's one, of the, that's one of the reasons they should get the hold of the book. <laughs> but you can my well say is if you just go into Google yeah. and just Google shadow IT, yeah. you'll have pages of surveys. Yeah. Because, right. uh, because a lot of, there's a lot of vendors in the market selling you the service to find it, and they like to say, look at what we found. You should be worried. Come and talk to us. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, that, they will all be listed out in the book. They're not listed on the screen. Um, but if the person who's asked that would like to send me an email, right. I will. And you have your email in the yeah. presentation. Um, yeah. So it's easy to. Yeah, I'll be pleased to send them my selection. 20% of the, the general view is that 20% of the enterprise content is structured, 80% is unstructured. There's no actual research that proves that. But when you think about the number of documents that your company produces every day, compared with the volume of data that you manage, only a fairly small amount is actually subject to process. But when you're writing, for example, a market, let's say you're doing a market assessment report on Finland, now it's joined NATO. There may be a procedure for writing a market assessment report, but there won't be a process. And the procedure is, a group of you will get together and come up with a framework, and then it will be approved by one of the marketing managers. And then they have some comments and it comes back to you. And you may want to go and talk to the project manager so that a procedure is a very fluffy way of getting to the objective. And knowledge workers use procedures, they don't use processes. They use all the capabilities that they have, either on their smartphones or on the on the on Microsoft Office. So it's much more difficult to work out where they are using an inappropriate process because the process has never been actually defined by IT. Business analysts have never got anywhere near it. It's just, this is how we do it. And you find that different countries would do it different ways. And the other thing they do, they'll do it in different languages, in different ways of presenting that information. And on this slide, and there is a reference if you want to go and find it. It's just a, uh, a very simple um, flow of how something might happen from starting a process. Let's let's do some um, let's do some initial um, issues and things like this to the final specification. Now, what's interesting about this diagram is it comes from a piece of work that was done in the Netherlands about five years ago by a good friend of mine who went to interview the senior executives 
in Dutch pharmaceutical companies and Dutch banks. And he said, how does the information you go to the board with get to you? And most of them didn't know because there are no specific procedures. Is that their secretary probably went and got it from someone or somewhere else. They actually had this wallet of stuff and they didn't know where it came from. Now, if you flip to another project I did for the IMF, you heard it first, is that when an IMF report goes to the board of directors for a fund application, every single piece of information in there is linked to the person who gave that information. So there is an absolute audit trail. So someone can say, ah, yeah, Johan gave us that number for GDP in Germany. Now that doesn't look quite right. We can go back to Germany and find out. That is like is getting nearer a process. But by and large, we have all these processes, all these procedures. And if the workarounds for data are bad, the implications for workaround on information are even greater because there isn't an audit trail. It's information in our heads that we just put down in any format that is, is, um, is appropriate. Yeah. Is that a, it, may, it makes me think that if the distinction you're drawing between process and procedures um, in system development, the distinction between methodology, which people get hung up on, and method. Yeah. I've always used method. I, I wouldn't disagree with you. It's just, it's my, it's my notation, if you like. Because yeah. I'm trying to get people to understand that all the efforts they're putting into process mining are only dealing with a relatively small number of processes, most of which don't have a huge impact on the customer. Or if they do, you can track it all the way back and say, oh, you wanted two of those. I'm sorry, we pressed the wrong button. But when it comes to information, you don't know it's incorrect. And there's some superb work by um, a researcher that looked at financial reporting information that is not until the auditors come in and they say, hold on, where did that number come from? And then all of a sudden there's a big panic because they don't know who produced that number and how they produced it and where, where, you know, where it came from. I only have to say autonomy purchased by HP to say, <laughs> some interesting ways of building financial information. So, and although there is some certification, I mean, 27,001 for IT, 19,901 for, for a quality, but frankly, they are not really managing procedures because you can get around those. I know I've done it um, when you know the auditors are coming in. So, the theme of my book is the risks and the rewards. At the top level, smart organizations are seeing that there is scope for innovation or at least improvement if, they are, if there's a transparent exchange of information about workarounds. And this is particularly true in the clinical environment. As I was saying earlier on, nurses are actively being involved in developing systems and validating systems to see how they can be improved. Then there's a whole chunk, which probably in the end doesn't really matter. We get by, yes, it's not quite right, but um, there's no immediate worry. And then there's a whole chunk which could be a major source of corporate risk. Now, risk is interesting because if you go and talk to the risk manager and say you've got a whole load of processes and you don't know actually whether they're being used properly, the risk manager will not be a happy person because the corporate risk register should be a listing of all the things that they need to care about, but workarounds and shadow IT will not be on that list. So the risk assessment of workarounds is something that no organization I've come across actually takes the time and attention to do anything about. I can have a Question from the public. Yeah. Uh, they were saying that regarding that organizations, um, what it is, uh, that we're doing, yeah, is when we we're talking about the audit uh, yeah. for ISO that yeah. they can, so they say that at the moment is they're going, they're being sued, and they are, apparently they're going to court and some of the auditors on the report 
um, yeah, and maybe I'm going to leave uh, leave uh, Mary to to comment. But basically, that they have been to the courts, and some of the auditors have been uh, reports can be trusted or are not rigorous. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to give her the voice. Well, Mary, can you can you voice yourself? Uh, Mary? Yeah, I was following the news. I was reading some articles about how um, apparently, uh, um, I think banks, small banks, but large international banks, some of them are suing some of these audit companies because apparently these audit companies, they were being paid to, you know, um, produce some paperwork or, or, or track what was going on at some of these uh, partner companies and they did not and they went bankrupt and it's had a lot of negative, um, you know, uh, neg negative outcomes for many, many companies and people. But I thought it was interesting that I'm all of a sudden I'm seeing that these audit companies are actually in the courts, like companies are suing them, that they're not doing their jobs properly. Um, that they, that their methods are not rigorous enough. I think is very interesting. But I, my my uh, thank you very much for that. I absolutely agree with you. But my rejoinder is that the audit companies should be saying to their class customers, "Can you validate that every single one of the processes that we are looking at, in fact, has been followed absolutely?" And they can't because they have no idea actually how that process is being used. They just hope it's going to end up correctly at the end. So I, I feel sorry for the auditors because often they get caught out because systems are not being followed. Yeah. It's a common misconception that auditors are the police. Mm. They're not. They rely on the information they're given. Yeah. Um, and mm. uh, if they're given dud information, either deliberately or accidentally, they have to, re they have to report what they see. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a fact that I don't think that the European Union's accounts have been signed off for about 20 years now. <laughs> now Still yeah. exists. <laughs> now, one of the difference between enterprise and clinical systems is clinical systems are subject to unannounced audits. The Quality Care Commission can come in on the opposite number in the United States and ask to see... The, the documents that relate to a process with no advance warning. That doesn't happen in enterprise IT. And it's one of the reasons that the in the clinical side, much more attention is paid to is this system actually working the way we think it should? Because the you know, if there's a, if heaven forbid, if there's a tragic accident where the patient, that's terrible. But if just the quality of care is reduced, is that the Quality Care Commission will rightly say, oh, inadequate, you know, fix it. And we're seeing everyday examples of where seemingly the processes are not being followed in, in hospitals in the UK. But overall, there is a strong emphasis on innovation and content improvement in, in electronic health. And part of the reason for that is that there's a lot of research that the clinicians have access to and can use. They can see what's happening in other trusts. They can see the problems with implementation. That's very rare to find that, in my experience, with IT management and enterprise. Now, this is work in progress. This is my corporate maturity model. And it's here for you to say, this is a load of rubbish. Where did Antonio find the speaker from? So this is the corporate maturity model on workarounds. At the top, we have a corporate policy towards workarounds and shadow IT, and they've established good practice policies on their use. Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's good. Or well, coming down one, we've identified high-risk processes. Maybe they're the processes subject to external audit or would have the biggest reputational risk if they go wrong. Um, and have engaged, in, engaged with employees to access the current state and potential mediation of the workarounds. Then it's getting starting to get worse. Well, we set up a task force, if in doubt, set up a task force, but at least they're formulating a workarounds policy. That workarounds policy has got to be about transparency of what is going on. Two, we've had some internal discussions about how best to monitor the use of workarounds. Oh, well, yeah, we sort of know they're there. At zero, there isn't a one. We've taken no action at all to consider the potential impact. 
that's just try, me trying to give a sense of where are you on that that list and with employees at the top what well, work around i have developed has been documented with it and shared i have regular meetings with it and my business manager because this is both together have to talk about this to see whether it's still whether it's been fixed is there a better workaround? Do we need to change the system? Then next one down, the least the manager is approving the workaround. Well, they're going to take the risk. But on the other hand, the manager has a direct responsibility to the employee. And so down to the bottom, I gather the way I use an IT and enterprise application is tracked by IT. And it will not my, be in my interest to develop a workaround. I know you're watching me. I'm just going to do it the way I should. And if that impacts the business adversely, that's not my problem. That's down to you. I'm dealing with a non-functional system. I, I'm working on this. So if you want to grab the slides from Antonio later and, and tell me that there's a better way of doing it, please let me know. Now, of course, then comes chat GDP. Oh, my word. This is driving everyone mad. 32% of people say they haven't told their manager they're using chat GDP. Now, what's important about this is that this is where the risks of information disclosure and information inaccuracy could have a big impact on the company. Because people are saying, I don't, I, I don't need to write a report, or I don't need to summarize it, I'll just give it to chat GDP. GDP. Very difficult to say that. This is a, there's an implication here because I think this is a workarounds machine. Yeah. You can just send it up into the cloud, it all comes back. You don't need to do a search anymore. You just give it a prompt and it comes back. Now, there's beginning to be a bit of, no, we can't go on like this for much longer. But it's a real challenge. And I think companies, and for that matter, the hospital I've been talking to, have no idea how they're going to manage this because it's going to take workarounds to the next degree. And basically, it's shadow IT. Yeah, you, can, you can say you can't access chat GDP, GDP from, a, from an internal device, one that we've approved. No, but you can, I can do it on my smartphone. I can email myself the results and then send it to myself and, and, and do the reporting. And sorry, this is so small because it would be something else. Have you seen this wonderful comment from the boss of, of Microsoft? This co have you come across Copilot, this, this um, new AI system? Sometimes Copilot will be right, other times usefully wrong. Usefully. Usefully wrong. This is the chief executive of Microsoft. And they have launched something which they acknowledge may actually be usefully wrong. You only know it's usefully wrong if you know what the right answer is. Otherwise, you don't know. Yeah, it reminds you of something I said to somebody about an AI. I said, if it's a true AI, it would pass a Turing test. But how do you test the system? Because when you test a system, you set up a test scenario mm -hmm. with an expected outcome. But if, you, if the system you developed is a black box, how do you know what the expected outcome is to set, to test it against? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a huge challenge. I guess you need another AI system to test it. To test it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Watch, watch this space. The one I really like most from Microsoft, this is all from Microsoft, is that GitHub, uh, the Copilot promises to unlock productivity for everyone. Among developers who use, use Copilot, 88% they are more say they're more productive. Microsoft are using this to show that people in the organization can be more productive. But software developers are not your average employees and they're not doing the average employee knowledge stuff. Um, so what worries me is that there's a whole push from vendors to say this is the way that you can be more productive. Use these new chat you now co-pilot systems. And yet we already know that within the organization, people are, are having to adapt to what they have. And when you look at this stuff, no one is under, giving any thought to how you're going to train all your employees at the same time how to use these new systems. So people will just find a workaround. 
So what are the implications for consulting projects? Firstly, when you go into a project, basically what's the ethos about workarounds and IT? What, what vibes do you pick up? Is it, is it transparency or is it absolute lockdown? Oh, it doesn't happen in our organization. We're absolutely first right, first rate. Are people looking at a balance between process mining and qualitative research? Or are they just saying we've got all these wonderful printouts and 86% of our processes are being managed just fine, with no problem at all? Are they looking at both the processes and procedures? Or have they just decided that processes, that's where the business is. Look, we've invested all this money in business process management tools. That's fine. That's, that, that's what we're interested in. Have the risks and the benefits been analysed? Has anyone sat down and thought what the implications are on, on reputation risk and on client uh, and whether the client's getting what they want? Are they using these as a basis for innovation? Well, they're saying we've got the best there is. We've got a seven stack, you know, architecture. It integrates everything. What more could we want? And I think the other thing as a consultant, I feel <clears throat> Will it will the presence of workarounds in shadow IT affect my work so that when I sort of say this is what you should be doing, they then apply what I've suggested and it doesn't work because I haven't found the workarounds in the shadow IT. And who gets the blame? Rather like the auditors, it won't be the IT department, it will be me. So I think it's scary times for a consultant. We have a few questions down the line, but uh, how many? I got I got one slide. Perfect. So yeah, we hold them. So this is my final question: Who owns workarounds? Who looks after? Who can care? Who cares about workarounds? Is it IT? Well, IT maybe doesn't exist. To a line manager, they may have a better sense of what's going on, but maybe we need a chief workaround officer. You've got to achieve everything else, officer. You know, why not a chief workaround officer? Could have a huge impact on the quality of the organization. Um, um, because I think the problem is that maybe your fundamental functional specs were wrong. You know, you you gave them the wrong information to start with, or it took two years to do the functional spec and in the mid in the process. Um, and the final thing I'll say, because this really just pulls from, from what I've been saying is. What happens when you buy another company or you get let another company, a part of your company go? All your processes change. You may have a whole new bunch of people in there having to learn new systems and they will have a different sense of what the non-functional expectations are to the ones that um, are already in. So you know, all I'm trying to do this evening is really just give you a sense that this is an area I think that as consultants, we could have a huge impact on, our, on the organizations we consult with by bringing up their awareness of shadow IT and workarounds and suggesting that they may actually want to capitalize on those situations and drive their business forward. So when you get the slides, you'll find links to some of the, these are open access, you don't have a subscription to pay for them. These are open access and those are some of the core papers you might just enjoy reading and pass them on to your clients. So. Questions. Yeah, I'm going That's to. That's what I feel like when I've done a consulting <laughs> project. <laughs> I'm going to ask the the first person making a comment that I have in my list is uh, Nosa. Dot A. So uh, Nosa, if you could unmute yourself and voice your question, you were mentioning about the relation between procedures and processes. So, Nosa, going to see. Hello, hi, 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 Martin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I was just trying to reflect on what you said about um, procedures and processes. And when you when you give an give an example of um, of the work I think with with IMF and how you could link every document to the particular person that sent it. And I was just thinking, doesn't that kind of relate with when you're when when you're actually doing process mapping at different levels? So if you're doing that process mapping at, at, at a higher level of maybe a level one or level two, it kind of seems procedural. But if you go right down to, to the task level, you could actually 
linked to the individual um, person that's, that supplies um, supply the information. Yes, I agree with you. I, I'm, I was really just using the IMF as an example of where they recognize that they absolutely have to get it right and that therefore they have to have that really solid audit trail. They can't afford to give the loan to Argentina because they got a number wrong. Um, someone's going to get quite cross about it. So I, I, I would absolutely accept that it's, a, that it's my notation, my view is a process versus procedure. And I'm struggling to try to differentiate between what's going on with what I call knowledge workers using primarily text video graphics compared with highly structured data about product shipments and, and logistics and things like this. So, you know, this is, to, uh, I, I, I just find it difficult sometimes to find just the right way of describing all this. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. One question at the end of the room. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for a, a great presentation, Martin. Especially enjoyed the behavioral side of it, which is not so technical. The one word I haven't heard on potentially by design is the word standard. I would be really interested in your views on the impact of workaround when an enterprise or a company has got to follow a specific standards. There's so many. GPI and so on. I'd be really interested in your views and how it's affecting the standards. Well, standards are interesting because most organizations will have master data schemas and there's an ISO standard for master data schemas and they are usually very rigorously followed. Nothing about the process, but what you call things is well defined. There is um, an ISO standard on knowledge management. There's a standard about how you capture knowledge and how you share it and the process you go through it. There is no standard for information management or information quality. Um, how about security in particular? Ah, now security, of course, comes into shadow IT mm -hmm. because you know the, the the existence of those shadow situations, because it's not made, there's no record of it by corporate IT, they don't know what the risks are because someone's using USBs and leaving them on trains capturing all the information on a personal Excel sheet and, and forgetting that they've sent it to half a dozen people. So actually, in particular, 27,001, you have to worry about how a company has retained the standard if it's got shadow IT. The two, to me, are incompatible. Okay. 9,001 is a bit different because it's about process quality on certain things. Yeah. But 27,001, in particular, I don't know how companies can get away with saying, we are compliant when they've got that amount of shadow IT. Actually right. saying, we're not in control of our IT department, but it's totally secure. Or in terms of information, I mean, it would just undermine pretty clear um, authoritative and information. Yeah, but, well, when you get into information, then you're getting into commercial confidence. You know, are you releasing information that is actually a trade secret, information about a patent, information about people, which is covered by um, GDPR? And that, that whole area, the, the irony to me is chief information officers don't care about information. They have no responsibility for content. They only have res responsibility for processing stuff. But no one owns information quality, certainly not the CIO, sadly. I'm going to go online and then there's, the lady. On. There's one at the back, you've got to do online first. Yeah, the lady one, on. and the, one and one. Okay. So the, the one I'm going to go online is with Michael. Uh, you were discussing about the you are a business analyst. So uh, please voice yourself and mute section. Yeah, hi. It was just um, it was answering that comment about different levels of process and procedures. Different people call them different things. Sometimes you have a, a process procedure, lower level, or a work instruction. Um, so I, I think one of the useful models that I've learned as a business analyst is the Poppet model. I've just put a link in the chat for everybody to to open. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody's got any on different levels of processes or procedures. Happy to have a chat about that. My experience, you normally do between four and six different layers, different layers, different levels. Yeah, uh, one of the things that, that is weak in the research that has been published, and there's an awful lot of it, is that there's usually it, the, the, the quality, the, the, in, the interviews with people don't look at the wider context of the organization. 
you know, they don't see okay. the standards there are. They don't understand what the, what which of the many business process, business analysts, pro, sorry, business analysis procedures have been used. They basically take a snapshot of what it is now. And that's because, with the greatest respect to my colleagues at the University of Sheffield, they basically arrive, spend three months doing the interviews and leave. Um, and it's very rare you find anyone doing an enterprise view of how those workarounds have arrived. So I absolutely take your point, but there's very little evidence as to whether a particular business process route is giving rise to more workarounds than another, if you like, whether it's yeah, one stronger or one weaker. But I absolutely take your point, and it's, I'd, love to, I'd love to sit down and talk to you because you know a heck of a lot more about business process management than I do. Uh, I'll drop my, yeah, I'll drop a link in the chat. Be grateful. There's a lady at the bank. Oh, yes. I was just going to ask about um, when you said people might be using workarounds for negative, purp uh, destructive purposes, and that was a different category. I wonder, does Alta look into that? Um, no, he doesn't. He knows that that could be the case. Right. But, it, but then you're getting into very difficult territory where yes. someone is deliberately trying to sabotage a, yes. a system. And I think that the, 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 the research community doesn't want to get down that route. Of course. Because there then could be, if there's a legal action, they could say, but, you know, these people came in and, you know, didn't mention it. So well, has anyone written on the possibility or the probabilities of how much this is happening? Well, no one knows how much is happening, yeah. but there are some papers which do raise, if, if we found this much going on that is even quasi-legal, if you know what I mean, is that they are sure that there may be people in that organisation who are not playing the game. But it, by and large, the research community stay away from that because yeah. they don't want to be associated with anything. <laughs> there is one ontology of workarounds in which one of the branches is have they been punished can they be punished and the thought that that an ontology of workarounds has the word punish in worries me mm. <laughs> um just just as emotionally mm. was there another yes we have a few uh, online the next one that they're going to ask to voice itself is liz liz if you can turn up your um yeah. and mute yourself if you want also to turn your camera and we can see you online. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, it, it was, oh, I have to go back to my question. Um, it was more, um, you, you talked about the concern, concern about using um, chat GBT, which I completely understand, but I come from a research background and using it um, as a tutor to help you learn, I think is very different. If I, if I got it to write my code, then yes, that would be a huge risk to the business. But if you type in a prompt, like, I don't know, I'm struggling with time series analysis, something simple like that, ChatGBT actually acts more like a personal tutor. Um, and um, I've noticed it with colleagues that using it that way seems to be really beneficial. Um, and it's identified training opportunities in areas where, um, skills were assumed. So I, I just wanted uh, some clarity if you're viewing it in terms of the risk in general, because the company isn't being proactive, or if it's people are literally using ChatGPT to do their work for them. No, I'm certainly not. I'm not throwing away what is now called uh, arti artificial, as a uh, AGC, artificially generated, content generated AI, AI generated content. I can see roles for, for, for these chatbots, for, for a chat GPT and a whole range of large language models. My concern is that if a company doesn't have an information management policy anyhow, how can it manage this wonderful new, frankly, wonderful new opportunity to make things more productive, to take the company forward? Because at the same time, there could be a counter that that is being used in an, in an, in an adequate way. And I think we're, we're Many companies, I think, are just sort of sitting back and thinking, I wonder whether it will get better. No, it, I don't think it will. You know, we've let the genie out the bag. But you're right to pick me up. I'm not criticising, I'll just take Jack, Jack GDP. I'm not criticising it per se, 
but just that it opens up an opportunity for people to create workarounds in certain areas much more easily than maybe they could in the past. And in and, and the end, the ultimate thing is, if you've had to go to a court of law and they said, where did you get that bit of information from? Are you going to be happy saying, well, chat GPT said that was what the answer was? <laughs> Maybe in the future, there's... <laughs> <laughs> but then the, in the future, the judge may be actually be using chat GDP. <laughs> I, think, I think that's falls into the category of innovation. But... Yeah. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I had a point to make about uh, analysis. Mm. Um, there's quite a famous piece of analysis which uh, talks, which refers to tacit versus explicit knowledge yeah. and this is the Toshiba bread baking machine mm -hmm. which after the uh, business analyst had gone through all the processes with the bakers the machine was turning out bricks and only when he did an ethnographic study in other words he went and lived with the baker for three months did he get at the tacit knowledge which the baker never thought to tell him about. She had to physically be there, observe and do it. Did the machine reach the perfection that it, it found which way it could actually produce proper bread? Mm. And, and that's what goes on in a lot of companies. There's a lot of asset knowledge being used uh, uh, in workarounds. And, and it goes back to also the culture, what culture which is what really the definition of culture what really happens when no one's looking the, the one of the interesting things about shadow it there are a number of bits of research that have been done that show that shadow it can support knowledge management because it enables people to quickly create ad hoc teams and share information and decide whether is this an opportunity you know should we get fred involved with this but we're not quite sure so we'll do it outside of the official route, because we don't want to be blamed for spending time on something that might not work. So smartphones, iPads, you know, WhatsApp, whatever, um, could be sources of knowledge, of knowledge transfer and knowledge development, even though they're not officially existing. And they then having a process to formalize that and bring it into the IT world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because if you don't have the process, if you don't own that knowledge, it's shadow. Yeah, and you don't have the that's it. Then you don't have the ways to move that if you have an onboarding process. So, yeah, good one. I may have one that may conclude the the show. Yeah. If I oh, I'm <laughs> listening to you for all that interesting time, I'm still not sure where to position work around on the scale of being a nuisance or an issue to being an opportunity. How would you? Uh, it can be both, and I think that's important. And I think the, the problem is that organizations are not set up. Well, the clinical systems are a bit more. Vendor press systems are not set up to have that openness about, you know, if you think this is innovative, come and talk to us because we'd like to make you a hero because you'll make us a hero. You know, there's just, if we ignore it, it'll go away. And if we look at the business process management dashboard, yeah, it's within 80% of what we thought. I think that's what I was saying, that I, is that you can get innovation. It's a bit benign. It doesn't, you know, it's not, or it can be really potentially quite a challenge. And I, that's why I think ideally you should start with a risk-based assessment and say, which of our processes has the biggest risk? Is it on customer satisfaction? Is it on employee retention? Is it on financial probity? And start taking off the high risk ones, because I think you will then gradually um, get a sense within the organization that you are interested in using their innovations for a, for a, for a wider purpose. But it's, it's a very important question. Um, at the present moment, no one's really talking about it. Last question for just just a, a thought, Martin. I mean, I'm a great fan of workarounds. Sometimes think I am a workaround. But the uh, an anecdote from Bupa is I was I was asked to look at one of their divisions, and I well the CFO and CFO explained the processes. When I went to the division, 
And she very wisely asked me to go and talk to the people at the front line. Mm. When I talked to the people at the front line, they they had uh, workarounds, what you'd call workarounds, different processes, different things that they did, which were uh, which the CFO and the CEO didn't know about. And but a lot of it was was um, their frontline responses to things like changes in legislation, mm. things like new customers emerging, things like uh, new things that no one had thought about emerging. And, and one of the problems, I think, is, and I think an ontology of um, workarounds was, was coming into my mind, so that there might be different types of workarounds or right. typology of, of yeah. workarounds, because some of these workarounds are very benign. Mm. And, and the fact that the CEO doesn't know about them is the way the, the world oh, works. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in some ways, the front line, and you see this with nurses in nurses stations, if you spend time with them, um, you know, the, the fact that they are doing workarounds, and it doesn't just apply to IT, as I'm sure you know, as you acknowledge, um, it, it can often be quite ben benevolent. But then, then, we, then we have the problem of, do, can we get them into the enterprise systems and it the lead time is quite significant yeah. and the effort is quite significant and sometimes the business case doesn't make sense sometimes it costs more to put them into the enterprise systems yeah. than the benefits of leaving them as workarounds so i think um uh, it's pretty picking out that point you know i mean are, 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 are workarounds evil or are they good and you, you quite rightly say they're both yeah. uh, but i think that kind of points towards um uh, some more useful work in this area um, and I, I haven't read the literature, so I, I can't, I don't know how far it has gone, but around the ontology of different workarounds and what, therefore, should uh, leaders or people at the front line be, be, you'd be doing about those workarounds. I think some of them are fine yeah. and some of them are not. I think I'll, I'll end with one of my favorite examples of where someone's done a workaround. I spent some time in Kuwait doing an ERP installation. And I still get birthday cards addressed dear, dear white instead of dear Martin, because the system put it was put in by which, which got the family name and the given name, but it didn't know the English names. You start with the given name and end with the family name. And, and it's odd because it's, it's not a workaround, but it's not what the system was designed for. Yeah, it's like it, 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 it just says given name, family name, but it assumes, you know, a given, particularly if you're dealing with Chinese, Korean, whatever, which is their correct name. And this comes back to the design of the system that there are prompts there, for example, to say, what language are you working in? Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a great example of where the systems um, don't quite meet the complexity of our new reality. Yeah. And when you mentioned chat GBT, which is what I'm working on, uh, but the, the scale, the pace of change now is just astonishing. Absolutely. And so for, I think, a business analyst or, or process engineer, um, uh, you know, this must be, a, you know, uh, having been a business analyst in the past, it must be a, a terrifically difficult thing now to keep pace with, uh, with, with that scale of change. Mm. I mean, I, I was... the workarounds, I think, in, in, in a way, might be become more prevalent as 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 we as we get us you know, the tsunami of change from ai sweeping across us you, you quite rightly observe the uh the the, the c-suite doesn't know what to do they are relaxed they don't know what to do the the ai people are not are not decelerating mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm glad you said that exactly. i think workarounds will become more, more prevalent yeah. well, i mean one, one of the things in alter and that's why that paper is so important is he recognizes a lot of it is if you're like not the fault of it it's the fault of the business changing and not thinking through how the process may need to change and and, and that's that's true and i think you don't have to be ill to get better. And that's particularly true where the world is changing faster than you can keep up with. Yeah. And I think that's that's where a lot of these organizations uh, are. It doesn't doesn't apply to to all workarounds. In the in, in the view, for example, these are workarounds that have been around for years and could have been systematized, but uh, in many cases. But I, I do think we're entering an era where you know, this is why I think I'm a workaround now. <laughs> 
<laughs> every day I work, wake up and someone has changed my world mm -hmm. and uh, with a, yet another GPT. And, um, and, and I, I then kind of, I would, I would never, I would never use the term workaround, though I might do tomorrow. I'll do it all. Yeah, I would thought, I would, I would thought, of, I would call it making it up as I go along. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, I think we're in an era of workarounds. Yeah, yeah. I was going to close the uh, yeah. like one silly point, really. Yeah. Maybe yeah. workarounds will become like uh, non-existent in the new AI realm. I mean, you're saying they could become more important. I think, they, I think they won't become non-existent, I think they become invisible. Well, they're already invisible. Yeah, I, I think they're even more invisible. <laughs> because we're giving so much power. If we become more ro robotic, maybe we won't need to have work around. Yeah. So no anyway. one's, you know, so no one's going to read my book. I mean, I'm very careful. Well, you you have have read your book. Solutions. I'll read your book, Martin. <laughs> I don't get any wrong. Anyhow, I'm just going to close. Very, a uh, very welcome and very uh, warm uh, thanks for the meeting today, tonight, and yeah, thank you, thank you again, and thank you everybody in the room and in the virtual room. Uh, good night, and yeah, yeah, good night. Thank you. So, welcome to the slides. Um, I think Antonio can make them available. Um, the book will be out, I hope, in about two or three weeks, and you'll be on the street. Um, and the nice thing about it being delivered digitally is if I find there are things wrong with it, I can go in and <laughs> I can do workarounds on my own board. <laughs>